Rust for Web Development. In this episode, we are going to give an overview of Warp. Warp is a lower level web framework which allows to build custom request flow model with the concept of filters. We'll show the code on the left, our requests on the right, and the response on the bottom right. We'll code a simple Hello World, a static file serving, and an overview of to-do REST APIs with custom filter for authentication. Okay, so let's code. So first here, we're going to use Tokyo for everything which is async. We're going to use our warp crate, and then our Saturday underscore JSON for to-do REST API. So now if we go and open our main here, we have our hello world, and we're going to do a cargo watch dash Q for quiet dash C to clear dash W to watch only the source folder dash X run. And that will allow us to have kind of a live development. And we have our hello world. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is make our main async with the Tokyo main. And we're going to add the keyword async here. And then we're going to use a warp filter, which is the core of the warp engine. And then we're going to create our first hello world route with warp path and then end, which will create a filter which says that if the path ends with a slash. So that will be the root. And the way that we give a result to this route is with map, when we want to have closure that is synchronous. Hello world from root. And we'll see later how we can do asynchronous handlers. And then the way that we're going to start the web server is with warp, serve the route, and then run, and that will take a tuple. The first member will be the IP address as an array. Second member will be the port. And then at the end here, we do the await. We press save, and everything compiles nicely. Now we don't have any result because we did not run it yet. Okay, so now what I like to do here when I do web development is to use a plugin of VS Code, which is named REST Client, is this plugin here. And that allows us to have .http files with a notation here that allows us to have this kind of notations, which is a little bit like Postman. And then we can see the result directly inside VS Code. So the way that we're going to do it is we're going to create a file, dev.http, for example, at the root folder. Then on top here, we can give a title section of our request. And then we can give our get and our URL here. So that's very simple for now. And that allows us then to click the send request, which will give us the hello world. Now, the next thing I do here is because that is not very convenient with the code, I do some relayout. So I actually put this on the right and this one at the bottom like this. And then I lock the group pane and I lock this one as well. Otherwise, when we double click on files, it will open there, it's kind of annoying. And so VS Code is awesome. And then I make that smaller. And then we're going to make that way smaller. But it's just to know when the, the web server is ready to serve. And so now every time I do a request here, I'm going to get this. And then if we do another request here, press send, and then we get a 404. So everything works very nicely, and that will allow us to iterate very fast. Let's go back to our working state. Okay, so now that we have that, we can do our first API, and we're going to have an API that is called high. And we're going to do a warp path high. And so that means that the path here will be high. And in warp here, you can do things with macros, but in this tutorial here, I'm going to show the macro-less way of doing things. Just that we understand well the APIs, the core APIs of warp. And then when you use warp, if the macro fit well your model, feel free to use them. It's not one is better than the other ones. It's usually it's good to understand the APIs and then use macros to remove some of the boilerplate code. So then after we're going to do the same thing here, which is going to be a map. We don't have any arguments for now. And then we're going to do a hello from I. Press save. Everything compiles. And now we need to combine the two APIs, obviously, because right now in our server, we're only giving hello world. So the way we do that is we're going to call it roots, which will have all the roots, and we do a hello world or hi. 
So basically, that tells Warp to first going to try to do this filter. And if this filter doesn't match, then it will go to the next one, which will be the high. And then in this case, it's going to check if there's a high in the path. Then it will return that. And if not, then we have the 404 that we saw before. And now, obviously, here, we need to make sure that we don't pass hello world to the server, but routes. Press save. Everything compiles. We send the request. We get our hello from root. And we give our high. Press send request. And we get our hello from high. Now, in the high, we didn't say that it should end at the end. So this means that if I have something like this, or anything, and then I press send request, I'm going to get exactly the same response. Because here, we're telling to warp, if there is a path, the first element is high, then it will match this filter. Now, there's another aspect here. We didn't specify for both APIs if we were going to use get or post or any other web methods. So here, actually, if we do a post and we send a request, we're going to get exactly the same result. And if we do a post, by the way, to, to the root, then we'll get the same as a get. Because we didn't specify that this filter here should take only get. So the way that it works with warp is you add a condition with and. And so we're going to say and we want warp get. So that is a filter that will match if the web method is a get. So the way it works in warp is that is a filter. We we'll create a filter that will match if the first path is high. And then you can combine this filter with another one, which is that will be the filter that will succeed if the request is a get. So now we press save, recompile the server, we do the send request, that will work fine. And now if we do a post and we send the request, now we get a 405 method not allowed. And actually it's pretty cool, yeah, because it does return the right error code. Now, for security reasons, you might not want to return this specific error code to not give too much information to the client. And that is something that you can handle with your custom error handling. So now we have to make sure that we have our get, press send, and everything works fine. Now, obviously, we can do exactly the same thing for the hello world. So we can add the new filter here for get, press save, that will recompile. And now if we go to the root, that will work. If we do a post, that won't work. So, so far, so good. Let's go back to get. Now, warp come with quite a bit of default filters. So for example, if you wanted to serve static files, let's say that we have web folder and .html, for example. And inside this, we're going to have our HTML here. Hello from index.html. And I'll close that. And now if we wanted to save this file, what we could do, we will probably create a const here for the web folder location. And then we'll create a new filter content, which will use the dear filter from warp, and you give a web folder. And that will allow to serve any content which is within this web folder. And now within our routes here, what we want is we want to add content. So again here, what we do is hello world or hi or content. And so now here the filter will take care of looking at the file, making sure that it exists and all of that, and will serve the content if nothing is matched before. So we are going to press save. Everything compiles. If we send a request on the root, we get our hello world because that was matching first with the end here. And anyway, it wouldn't have matched with a file system. And then after we do an index.html, we send the request, and now we get our HTML result here. We put in the file. So very clean, very simple. So typically you wouldn't do that. You will have the root folder that goes to index.html, obviously. So the way we are going to do that is we're not going to use a hello world now. We're going to remove that. We're going to clean a little bit and call this section APIs for our APIs. And as we are going to add more APIs later, we are going to organize our routes. And here we are going to say that is just the APIs for now. And later we'll see how we are going to add more. And that will be our static content section. 
the first one will be to serve the folder, and the second one here will be the index. What you will do for the root here is something like this, warp, get, we do the end of the path end. And as we can see here, it doesn't really matter the order. So I can start with the path end or do the get, whichever one I want to execute first. And then finally here, we're going to do a end. And now we want to serve the file. And so the way that that will work will be with warp fs. And then there's a filter that is called file. And you need to give the file path. And here I'm going to have a dirty way. You will probably use path usually, but we're going to do this way for now. Format the web folder and index.html. So obviously that is Linux or Mac. And now we're going to create a static site and we're going to combine these two filters, content or index. In fact, this would probably call it root be more precise. And now the routes, which is all the routes will be the APIs or the static site. And so we see here that the power of filter become very, very powerful here because you can compose your filters the way you want it. So now we're going to press save here. And now if we go back here to our index, we get the same content here. Okay, so our API section here is a little bit lame. So what we're going to do is create our to-do REST API, just as an example. So the way I like to do it is I will create a module, which will be to-do REST, for example. I will create the file, obviously, to-do REST.rs. And in fact, I will have them under a web folder and so on. But so far, that is the gist of the pattern here. And now we're going to use the warp filter top here. And here's a trick. Now we want to have a method that implement the filter. So the way we do that is we want it public, fn, and we're going to say it's the one that has all of the to-dos filter. And for now, it doesn't take any argument. And the trick here is we're going to implement the filter trait, and we're going to extract, we take an associative type here, something that implement the warp reply trait object. And the error here will be a warp rejection. And we're going to close that on the left here to have a little bit more room. And so that is a gist of a filter method. And the way you do it here, in our case, we want to do the list to do's for now. And we're going to do a warp path. And we're going to say it's to do's. We want it for get only. And then the path must end because when there is a number or something else after the pass, that would be for the get to do. And then for now, later we'll see how to do asynchronous again. We are going to use a map and just for the test here, we'll get to do's. And we don't put a semicolon because we want that to be returned in this method. Press save, hopefully it compiles. Now we go back on our main. And what we want in our API is to have high or and here we're going to put our to-dos filter function that will return the filter. And then obviously that needs to be imported. Press save. And now if we send a request here to to-dos, send the request, we'll get to-dos. If I do a post, method not allow. But then if I do one, two, three or whatever, yeah. And then I send the request, then it say not found. Because we say that it was going to end, which is what we want. And when it ends, even if you have the slash here, that will be a valid end. So that will be okay. Okay, so we get that working now. So one of the first aspects here that we need to change is to make sure that our request handlers, and that is the last function here, which is a closure in this case, that handles the request and returns the result. You usually want it to be asynchronous to make sure that you can do database queries and other things and that it doesn't hold the thread. So in this case here, in the WAP API, if your function, if your filter is synchronous, you use map. And if it's asynchronous, you use the end then. And now we need to make that asynchronous. In Rust, the async closure is not stable yet, but we can give a closure which has an async block. And that is what we're going to do here. I was just going to add this. Now we need to return the OK value. There is an error here, and if we go back here to look at our error, it doesn't have the right type here to be able to infer 
what needs to be replied. So one way to do that is here to use a turbo fish and to say that will return a str and a warp rejection. And you need that only in the case of closure. When you give a full function here, the function will be fully typed and then the compiler can find its ducks. So now we press save. And when it's done, we can do our request and it works exactly the same. But now that is async, which is much more powerful, obviously. So now if you want to create your own function rather to give a closure, then you will create an async function to do list, for example, and then that will return a result. Here we're going to give the full string object and a rejection. And then we're going to say, we all list to do's. Then we do our to string. And now rather to have our closure here, we can just pass this. Press save. And now we can go back here and send our request and that will give our new text here. And so now our code is ready to scale a little bit more. So now obviously we want the to-do list to return a list of JSON objects. We're going to say that actually the function will return a JSON object, a JSON reply of warp. So we're going to import this. We're going to create our JSON object. Obviously we're not going to get from the database. So that will be a to-do for later. Right now, we are just going to hard code it, a dirty way of doing it, but to make sure that we show the concept here. So we're going to use a JSON macro from CRD JSON, which is pretty impressive. And that will be this one. And now we're just going to have two little CD data here, which is the ID and the title to do one and to do two. So in this example here, everything will be hard coded. So now we do a let to do. So we're going to shadow the variable here to create our new to do object, which will be kind of a warp reply json and we're going to give our crd json so that's basically take a crd json and transform it to a warp json reply and now rather to return the string here we return that we're going to press save everything should compile and now when we go to do list press save and now we have our json we have the right content type so content length and then we have our data here. In production code here, you will return your own objects, probably your own struct that will implement a reply, probably. Okay, so now let's scale a little bit this code here. Let's say that we want to do the get to do. So one thing we can do here is actually have a path and have it common for all our APIs. So we're going to have let to do's base equal, and now result will have the path here. We're going to have that. And then after what we're going to do here is let list. So that will be our list. And we're going to have our let get, which will use to do base, so very similar. And then and we're going to do the warp get. And now here's a trick. The next one here, we don't want to end because we want the API to be something like, like to do's one, two, three, for example. So the way here that we're going to use, we're going to use a warp filter, which is going to take it from the path. And the name is param. And that will take the next one here, which is this one, and will parse it to match the next function here. That is where the magic happens. So now we do, a, and then we'll create our get here to do get. And now what we want to return here is list or get. So we compose these two routes. And again here, we didn't change anything on the main.rs here. All of this can happen in this. So the main.rs is completely abstracted from this composition here. So now we're going to go back here. We don't really need this one. We are going to create here our to-do get, which now is going to take a i64. And that is a very powerful thing of warp because filters can extract data from the request, but then because everything is well typed, and then it will have the type information of the final handler. So here, Russ is making the work here to make sure that the param is going to be past this type. So that is kind of very well designed from the warp perspective. So now here, we're going to do a CD one here, just to show the example here. Later, we can get from DB, obviously. But for now here, we are just going to do a to-do ID and we're going to just return the ID that was sent. And in the title, we're going to call format, and then to do, and then the ID. 
So obviously he will be always successful here because he will always return the value. And then we do the same thing here. We do the CRD JSON swap reply with this here. And we're shadowing the variable here. It's completely okay. It's actually what we want. And then we do a okay to do. And we don't have to do the turbo fetch here because again, Rust has all the information here as part of the function signature. So now if we press save, hopefully it compiles. It does. If we send the request, we get the same result here. And now if we do a one, two, three, send the request, and now we get this silly result here, but we get working result, which is ID one, two, three, to do one, two, three. So that's pretty cool. But what about the create here, such as we can read the body of the request. So we're going to do the create to do. And for this here, we're going to follow the same pattern here. So we're going to have a async fn to do create. And now what we want is a data value, which will be a JSON CRD value. So we're going to import here from JSON CRD, return result JSON. And again, here is a very simple example. In your real application, you can have actually your own types here. For the to do, we'll do a write to DB, which we are not going to do. So for now, it's just a CD to do equals the data. We are just going to echo the data back. And then again, reply, warp, reply, JSON, to do. And then we do our OK to do. So now we have this function here, which is a create. And so here is how we are going to wire this up. So we're going to do a let create equal to do base. And now that should be a post. And then after that should be a warp body. And the warp namespace is very nicely done. JSON. That would basically parse the body as a JSON. And then if you go to the tutorial here, there is a way where you can limit and throw an error if the content is too big. But here I want to show the simple example. And then after we're going to say, and then, because again, we want to be async to do create. Don't forget the semicolon. And then we compose that again. Or create, press save. And then what you will do here is you will do a post. Probably remove that. Content type, application JSON. And then we are going to add our fake data here send a request, and we get it back. Very simple. And so obviously, that is a silly example here. You will post something, you will probably not have ID at all, and then the database will create, and then you will return either only the ID or the JSON object with the ID and the properties, depending on how you want to manage it. It's relatively simple, and you can build, compose your REST APIs the way you want it. And then you put it in your module here, like this one. And once you compose it here, again, we didn't touch anything inside here. Once we did it once for to do filters, then we could just stay here and just keep improving that. Okay, so now let's implement our own custom filters. And a good one here to implement is authentication, something that will check to make sure that the user is authenticated. So the way we're going to do that here, we go back to main and we're going to create a mode security, for example. Create our file here, security.rs. And with warp, everything starts with a filter. We are going to have a const for our header, and the value will be something like uh, the user ID dot the expiration dot signature. Obviously, here we're not going to implement the algorithm, so we are just going to make a mock here and just make sure that this string kind of match. Yeah, so it's going to be very, very simple here. But then after you can put whatever code you want. So the way to implement a filter is very similar to implement a handler in a way. So that will be a pub, fn, check auth. For this example, we are just going to check the header to make sure that it match whatever format we want. And a filter extract data. So we're going to do extract is a tuple. And that is a little trick that allows the whole thing to be extremely flexible. Here, for this function, we don't want to return anything. So we're going to return nothing, and that is a tuple. So we need to have the comma here at the end. So it's a tuple of one and a tuple of void. And then after we do our error, which can obviously have our warp rejection clone. And now we want this filter to be able to work for anything. We want to be able to put it on any 
filter chains that we want. So to do that, we're going to do a warp anny. So that's basically use create a first filter with matching anything. And now we can say that we're going to have an end. And the magic here is we're going to extract the header. So again, the namespace is going to be warp header. We want it as a string. So we use a turbo fish notation. And then we're going to say that we want the header XAuth. And then once we have that, for now, we're going to have and then. So the same thing, the goal of a filter is to extract the data and to return it a little bit like a web handler. So at the end here, we have the same pattern here, which will return a value. But now, because we have called these header things here, we're going to have a value, which we can name XAuth, which will be our string. And we need to give the type here to help the compiler. And now we do the async move, because we want to move the variable into the function. And now we're just going to do a check auth. And that obviously is going to be very silly here. So it's going to be if x auth ends with exp signature. So obviously here you will build your, your algorithm here to do the whole check. And for now, just for now, we're going to panic. Don't do that obviously in production or even in test or dev or whatever, but it's just to explain the pattern here. And then if that is okay, then it will just return the okay. And because we are within the closure business, we need to give a little bit information about the type, warp, rejection, save. And now we can use these methods inside our to-do rest. So in our example here, we're going to add it just before the methods and we are going to call our function. And the trick here for now, because we don't want to extract anything, but a filter always extracts something, then we do the untuple one. So that is a trick to make sure that this is not passed to the to-do list because this one is just about uh, getting the things. So now we call our function and we can do that here. And we're going to do just before the param. There's a reason for it, we'll see later. And just before that. And now we press save. And now if we go back here and if we do a post, everything should work fine, hopefully. Now, if we don't have the header and we do the send request, then we have a bad request, missing request header, exhaust. This error here that comes is actually come from this filter here. That is not our error. So now if we go back and with a bad signature, for example, a bad format, and then we send the request, then boom, we have a big panic attack here. So one way to handle these exceptions is to you go to your security and we are going to create a struct which is going to be our fail auth it has to be debug and now the simplest way here is to implement the reject trait for your struct and now rather to do a panic we are going to return error warp reject custom and your struct Again, there's many ways of handling that. That is the simplest way to do that. Press save. And now, if we go back, that will work because we have the right things. If we don't have the header, the header filter through this error doesn't crash the server. And then if we have the header and we had the bad format, press send. And now result to have the server crashing, server didn't crash at all, then we get this rejection. And again, there's many ways here to have custom message and handling. You can obviously send back JSON and so on. It's a, probably the topic for different videos. But that, the gist of it is how you handle errors. Now, let's say that actually we don't want the filter to only check authentication, but also to authenticate and return the user information. So here we could rename our function, do auth, and result to return void, we want to return some sort of user context. So here we're going to create a very simple one, pub struct user context, and just a user ID. And now we return a user context. So first here we have our check format. And now let's say that we want to extract the user. That is where you will validate the signature and all these kind of things. So for now, we are going to do a very simple parsing not even with regex. So basically we take the header, we split two parts with the first dot, we take the first part, and then that is the option. And then 
we take the V here, if there's a value, and then we pass as I64, and we return an option. So that will basically, that will return an I64. And then we return the OK. Make sure we give the type information, because we are within a closure. And then we build our user context. If not, we are going to return the same error. Obviously, we don't need and want that anymore. And in the production app, it's tricky because you don't want to give too much information into the web client on why authentication has failed, because otherwise it's information to hackers that could be avoided to be given. But at the same time, on the server backend, you want to log this information to be able to uh, troubleshoot later. And so the trick here is when you build your error handling in any web server, you have to take this kind of two dimension in account. So now if we press save, our to-do rest doesn't compile anymore because now we have a value. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove all of this on top of one. And what we've been doing here is that the do auth is going to actually add another parameter to all our function handlers. So now in all of this function, we are going to have a data, which, and we're going to put underscore because we're not going to use it for now, but a user context. Do that, make sure we import that. And so now if we press save, everything compiles. Because what is happening here is all of these do auth is again, extracting this information and putting it in the filter chain, such as the last one, get this data as the parameters and everything is fully typed. And so now, for example, if we really want to uh, do a little hack, which is on this one here, when we return the fake data, we're going to add user ID and then user context, user ID. Obviously, this is super dirty here, but just to show, press save. And then if we go back, and then we're going to do our 555, for example. And then we're going to send valid information here. And we don't need those guys. And now we're going to press and request. And now we get our ID 555, which is our fake ID here, which is the echo of what we give in the get. And we get our user ID 123, which come from here. That's it. So it's very powerful here of how you can combine, again, your routes with your own custom filters and so on. Now, the cool thing about the filter model is it doesn't have to extract data only from the request. So for example, here, if you have a global resource that you want, like a database pool that you want to share across all of your REST methods, the way you will do that, you will go to your main, create probably a struct, DB pool, or data layer, or whatever you want to have. And then you will probably do a filter with DB pool. And one technique that I use is I use the arc pattern here, the reference counting, such as I don't have to fight too much lifetimes. And that will implement filter and will return. We do the tuple way and we'll return the arc db pool. And then the error can be unfailable, which means that it cannot fail, which is fair enough for this one. And then we have the clone here. And then because we want to make sure that that can be included in any filter chain. We're going to do the warp any again, and then we can use a map. We don't have to be async on this one. We're going to move the argument here to closure, and we're going to do a DB pool clone, such as the request handler will have his own reference counted DB pool. And we press save, that should hopefully almost compiled, we forget to include this guy, save, everything is good. Now what we want to do here, we're going to create our resource, so let db pool equal arc new db pool. And now I'm going to give it to the filter here, clone, I clone it in case I'm going to use it below, in this case we didn't really need to clone it. And now I'm going to go to my to-do filter, db pool, arc db pool, make sure to include this and this, and then press save, everything should compile relatively well. We have some yellows, then we're going to take the db pool. And the trick is to do it always at the same place. So let's say we're going to do after the user context. So we're going to have we db pools like this. 
we need to clone it because we need to make sure that we increase the reference count. And we're going to do after the auth, after the auth. And now we go at the same place here in all our function, and we should be able to add this. Press save, making sure that we import the function, press save, and everything works. And the beauty is that now I have DB pool here that I can use if I want inside my object. So here we're not using it, obviously, but you will have a resources that is shared across everything. And that would be it for this first episode of Web Development with Rust. Many more to come, so feel free to subscribe and add a like if you want to see more of those. Until next one, happy coding.